It's great to be with you again on this great Lord's Day morning. We're continuing uh, the series on the stages of faith development. As we've noted, we tend to go through three stages in our faith development. I call the first phase the chaos phase. That's when, uh, say, we're raised up in a religious family. Uh, we're kids. We know our parents believe things. We go to church with them. But we haven't committed ourselves to that way of life. We're still doing our own thing, uh, acting out of our own self-interest. As soon as we're outside the sight of our parents, we're obviously not uh, doing exactly what they want us to do. We're doing what we feel like doing. And of course, inevitably, that kind of behavior gets us into trouble and creates chaos uh, in our life. And of course, some people are still living out chaos as adults. Uh, they never grew up spiritually. So they're still out there uh, going along, maybe whatever the norms are at work, but the minute they're outside of work or outside of the home, they're acting out in their own way. Now, a great transformation usually occurs between the chaos phase and phase two, which is the conformity stage. That's where we learn to conform ourselves to a faith understanding of living. We understand this to be the will of God, and now we're conforming ourselves to that. And the great benefits of that is it provides stability in contrast to the chaos that was occurring earlier in our lives. And if we continue to grow, stage three is the questioning stage of faith, uh, where we ask a lot of questions now about these things that we believe. Why do we believe that? What are the reasons for that? And so the questioning stage is a continuing growth process. And the final phase of faith I refer to as conviction. This is where you have become deeply personally convicted. You know what you believe. You know why you believe it. And you are driven not to conform externally, but you are driven internally to live out the things that you believe. Now we looked at uh, Jacob as an example of this, but now we want to look at an even earlier figure, Abraham. Abraham from chaos to conformity. I want us to note something to begin with. Abraham grew up an idolater. Abraham grew up an idolater. We know that because Joshua, this of course was the great leader of the people after the Exodus and the wandering in the wilderness who led them into the land of Canaan to take it, whom Jesus was named after. Jesus in Hebrew is uh, Yeshua, our Savior. But at the end of his campaigns as He's sending the people back out into the land to occupy it. He says in chapter 24, verse 2, Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, long ago your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. So even though it's not explicitly stated, uh, earlier, when it talks about Abraham, uh, we know from what is said here that the environment that he would have grown up in was an idolatrous environment. Uh, I would suggest to you that the root sin behind every sin is idolatry. Uh, when instead of God, I put anything first in my life, whether it be self, or money, or prestige, or whatever it may be, 
whatever becomes more important to me than God is an idol that I've created in my own heart. And I would say, as we look at sin, usually there's an idol of some kind in our hearts that cause us to act out in foolish and sinful ways. Of course, idolatry was much more basic in the days of Abraham, for they actually built temples to the gods. Uh, people believed then that, many of them, that there was a creator God, but they believed that somehow he was distant and far and removed. And so they looked instead to lesser gods that were more local. And so the average uh, community would have a god, or your family would have a god that you felt like you had gained the favor of that might help you and benefit you. That's how idolatry worked. But let's look at Abraham. Things change when God calls Abraham. Chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. The Lord had said to Abram, that's past tense, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So right off the bat, if we're going to change from being an idolater, we have to hear the call of God. Now, the call of God from Abraham was very distinctive. And it was a call to leave the country where you're in, leave the people that you've been a part of, leave your father's household. I want you to go with me, and I'm going to show you where I want you to go. Now, you have to put yourself in the shoes, or shall we say sandals, of a person living 4,000 years ago. The average person 4,000 years ago was born, raised, lived, and died, and probably never traveled farther than 10 or 15 miles from their own home, wherever they were born. Uh, of course, there were traveling merchants. There were, there were exceptions to that. But most people uh, didn't go very far from where they began. But going back into chapter 11, we learn something interesting. Verse 31 of chapter 11. Terah, the father of Abraham, took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. So we learn where Abraham came from. And this is kind of interesting, uh, Ur as we probably call it in the, the Semitic languages, it would be Ur. Ur was, as far as we know, uh, perhaps the earliest city uh, constructed. Now, there are little villages all over the world, but this was a city-state. It was located in modern-day Iraq, along the banks of the Euphrates River. It became uh, down the southern part of Iraq. Uh, and even till this day, even though the city's been abandoned for way well over 2,000 years, you can go there and see big, they call them ziggurats, that look a little bit like the pyramids in Egypt. Uh, that a huge one is built at Ur that still stands today. And they estimate that the population at the time Abraham would have been there at around 60,000 people, which would have been the largest populated city in the world at that time. 
So where does Abram come from? Well, he comes from the, one of the most advanced civilizations of the world at that time, the Chaldean civilization. He comes from the major city of that uh, environment, Ur. And so you, you've already arrived at the pinnacle, at the best place, and now God wants you to leave it all behind and go somewhere you've never seen. But you know it's not going to get better than Ur. It's obviously going to be a challenge. And another interesting fact, it says Terah took his son, which suggests what? Abram tells Terah he had this vision, and God told him that to go to a place he'd show him, but Abram didn't take initiative to leave his family or to leave his country. But instead, his father is the one that had to take the initiative, and Abram just kind of uh, tagged along, along with the rest of the relatives. So instead of leaving the relatives to go to land, Abram slowly went along with the relatives. He made about a 350-mile walk north along the Euphrates River to the city of Haran. Now, we don't have uh, excavations at Haran because it's still a major city to this day that's been occupied all these years, a major trading point even today. Now, the Euphrates River has moved, and it's miles away from where it used to be, and that's why one of the reasons Ur got abandoned. It's no longer on the Euphrates River. So that's where Abram was from. And we know they worshipped in the city of Ur the moon goddess called Sin. Kind of appropriate, isn't it? Sin. And we also know that the town of Haran also worshipped the moon goddess Sin. So towns would take one special god or goddess that they thought was their special one that would benefit them. And so there's a, you can see how his idolatrous uh, ancestors want to travel from one place that worship the way they worship to another place that worship the same God. And so we find uh, Abraham tagging along, but we don't see him taking initiative. He only goes halfway to the promised land instead of all the way and hangs out in Haran until his father dies. Notice chapter 12, verse 4. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. God didn't say anything about taking relatives. He was talking about leaving relatives. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the side of the great tree of Moriah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. So God's giving Abram a tour of the land he's planning to give to his descendants. Now you can imagine when Abram left Ur, a fairly congested place, and now he's in the land of Canaan. There were cities there. There were walled cities there. Jerusalem was at that time, 4,000 years ago. Megiddo was. Uh, all kinds of cities that later were prominent cities were Canaanite cities at that time. Now, they were small compared to Ur, but as Abraham walked through the land, he could not fail to see this was not unoccupied land. That would be like somebody telling you, I want you to sell your house and take all your possessions and go 
to California. I'm going to take you there. I'm going to give this land to you. And you show up and you find, well, you know, California is pretty full. And the house prices are so much I can't afford any of them. Well, that's fine. You can just be a wanderer until some future time when I'm going to give this land to your descendants. So you can imagine Abraham is, is struggling to believe that God has called him and God plans to bless him and create a great nation through him and give him this land, but he's looking at the land and it's already occupied. So Abraham is going through a struggle of believing God. Now he builds an altar which suggests I, I'm... I'm believing that sometime in the future that people will worship you here in this land, even though I know they don't now. But Abraham was 75 years old. So we don't have a lot about Abraham's early life like we do Jacob's where we saw all the chaotic behavior. All we get is a little idea that the chaos hadn't gone away completely uh, in Abram's life, because Abram gets into trouble. Chapter 12, verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, then they will kill me, but uh, will let you live. Say you are my sister so that I'll be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. Now, it's not as if Abraham's fear was not justified, because we see that occurring, but also we see Abraham doesn't really trust that God's going to protect him, he still thinks he's got to protect himself. And so one of the ways he's going to protect himself is he's going to be a liar and a deceiver. He's not going to shoot straight with Pharaoh. And this puts his wife in a terrible compromising situation. Picking up with verse 14. When Abraham came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram and Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me, he said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Uh, clearly, Abraham was struggling to believe in a God that would take care of him. And so he was showing some belief by going to this land that God was telling him to go to. But when famine hit and suddenly he had to leave that land, he had to go to another very significant place. Of course, this was after the major pyramids were built when Abram walked into Egypt, all the three big pyramids we see, and much of the building was already there. Uh, matter of fact, that first dynasty had passed on, and we were at a, a kind of a weaker period of Egyptian rule before a foreign power conquered them, the Hyksos. But anyway, this is the time in which Abraham lived, and unfortunately, he not only had been an idolater, but also was a liar. But God gets him out of trouble. 
God had to take the initiative, somehow punish Pharaoh, and Pharaoh eventually, I'm sure, he questioned Sarah, and she didn't lie at some point, and so he found out. And then he sent him on his way. Uh, but with all the blessings that had come his way, Abraham, as God said, is being blessed, and even though he's a liar, God allows him to be blessed. But what did God say? You know, leave your relatives and go to this land I'll show you. Well, Abram decided to bring some of the relatives along, and that's going to present problems. You know, we always think we know better than God, especially where chaos phase, trying to either enter the conformity phase of faith, and so we don't take God's advice seriously. And this is going to get Abram into trouble. Problems with a relative, chapter 13, verse 5. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together. For their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herders and Lot's. The Canaanites, Perizzites, were also living in the land at that time. So we don't want to do this in front of potential enemies. So Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I will go to the left. So again, Abraham, being the more spiritual minded, takes the initiative, the older one too, and he says, let's not have this tension between us. But of course, we wouldn't have had this tension, but I decided to bring you along, uh, not in accordance with what God told me to do didn't leave the relatives, I took the relatives. But now I'm trying to solve the problem and realize we're going to have to part company. Well, notice what takes place, verse 10. Lot looked around and saw the whole plain of the Jordan towards Zoar was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tent near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. And we know that story. Now what do we learn here? Abraham was trying to be generous, and when he was generous, Lot chose what he thought to be the best-looking place. Now, uh, remember well-watered place? Again, this, this country is more like uh, Arizona and New Mexico and parts of Texas than it's, than it's not like here. This much, we're much greener than they are there. We get more water here than they get there. However, the one major river in Canaan is the Jordan River. And like the Nile River, during certain seasons of the year, it overflows its banks. So all along the Jordan, the plain leading to the Dead Sea, there's an open area. And what would happen is the Jordan would flood. It would take all that rich soil and it was one of the best places to live. You could grow crops, just like the Nile, very desolate. And yet when the Nile overflowed its banks, it made rich soil and the people lived well. It was as big a river as the Nile, but it was big enough for the people, a number, Sodom and Gomorrah and other cities, to establish themselves there. And it was a place of financial plenty. And so Lot chose the best-looking plot of land, the most affluent place, and left Abraham to live in the hill country of Canaan. 
But of course, this was going to lead to problems. Uh, his capture, Lot's capture and redemption takes place in the next chapter, chapter 14. Some foreign kings came down, invaded, defeated Sodom and Gomorrah and their kings. We're carrying them off, chapter 14. Uh, yeah, 14, verse 11 through 16. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food, and then they went away. They also carried off Lot's nephew, uh, Abraham's nephew Lot, and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. A man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre and the Amorite, a brother of Eshkel and Anna, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abraham heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. That's the farther extremity of the northern part of Israel. During the night, Abraham divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions together with the women and the other people. Now he runs into the king of Sodom and Gomorrah who had hidden when their people were captured. And the king comes out and says, well, you can keep all the goods, all the, all the financial things you've captured. I just want the people back so I can become king again and inhabit my city. And then Abraham says, no, I don't want any of your stuff. I don't want any people. Uh, so he's showing some spiritual wisdom uh, at this point. Having brought a relative has cost him a lot. God would have spared him from this, but again, Lot thought he knew better. I mean, to be, Abram thought he knew better about Lot, and it didn't work out. But then they had this very interesting celebratory meal. Same chapter, verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Now, it's that mysterious figure that comes back in the book of Hebrews that we don't know anything else about. Uh, except his name was Melech, Zedek. Melech is king. But he's king of Salem. We believe that was an early name for later Jerusalem. Salam means uh, peace. And so he was the king of the town of peace. So we find out there are other believers in the one true God, the creator God. This is not some lesser God, the God most high, that Melchizedek worshiped. He said he's the creator of heaven and earth. So they worshiped the same God. So there were people who were not idolaters scattered throughout the ancient world that still worshiped the one true God. But they were few in number and scattered across the earth. And in honor of this, Abraham shared a meal, gave 10% of what had been taken as, as homage to God and to this servant of God, priest of God, and king of Salem. And then in chapter 15, Abraham finally believes God. It's not that he didn't kind of believe God or he wouldn't have made it all the way to Canaan, but it was a kind of, well, yeah, I kind of believe you, God, but I don't, I'm not willing to put all my uh, energy into that. It's kind of like I trust you, but don't get out of my sight. 
So I trust you as far as I can see you. Well, I don't trust you further than that. So Abraham was struggling to believe God. And now let's think about how it was difficult. It was difficult because Abraham's getting older, Sarah is getting older, and they have no children. So how are they going to have a great nation and have no children? So even if this place was intended for Abraham, how can his descendants inhabit it when he has no descendants? And so we read chapter 15, verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant of my household will be my heir. So Abraham is basically finally getting honest with God. He's honestly saying, you know, I just don't see how this is going to work out. I know what you promised. I came here and the place is occupied. That's not a good sign. You know? It's not like I found a house here and it's empty. It's all full up. And now I've not had any children, and I'm past the age, and Sarah expecting to have children, and you're here still talking about these descendants of mine. I'm just saying it looks like not only am I not going to have descendants to pass on what I have, but I'm going to have to turn over my estate to my lead man, Eliezer of Damascus, and not even to a son or someone in my own family. It continues on, verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. So now we get the idea. God takes him out, night, out under the night sky, looks up at the stars, and God says, try to count them. How many are there? And, of course, I remember my mother taking me out and uh, showing me the stars and saying, uh, try to count them. <laughs> After a while, you realize, I can't, I can't really do that. It's, it seems like one twinkles in and Paul goes away. It's just too many to count. Well, that's the point. He's saying you're going to have these many descendants and no this man's not going to be your heir. You're going to have your own child. And in spite of his circumstances, Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. And so, in light of Abraham's faith, God is now going to make a covenant with Abraham. Therefore, Abraham is moving from the chaos, iffy conformity stage to a full participation in conformity to God. We read that in chapter 15, verse 7. He said to them, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land and to take possession of it. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abraham drove them away. Now this may sound strange to us. Animal sacrifice sounds the same to us. Uh, you know, odd, strange to us. But what's interesting is we find that it was practiced universally. We haven't found any ancient people that didn't practice sacrifice in acknowledging there were 
powers or gods or something greater than themselves to whom they sacrifice uh, seeking their good pleasure and uh, their generosity and help. And so here's Abram. Uh, again, the word for covenant actually means to cut something. So the idea of a covenant is that animals were cut in half and animals, part of the carcass on one side and the other. Then we read this very fascinating next description. We pick up verse 12. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back from there, for the sins of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. So here we get a little bit of insight why doesn't God turn over this land to Abraham right now? Well, because the people living in the land are sinful, but their level of sinfulness has not reached the level where terminating them entirely is the only option left to God. And so he says, the wickedness of the Amorites isn't great enough yet for me to punish them by eliminating them and replacing them uh, by your descendants. But to let you know that I am serious about what I'm promising you, that you're going to get this land and that you're going to have a descendant, I'm going to make a covenant. And that's what you did. You made an animal sacrifice. And first of all, you cut the animals in half. And then let's read verse 17 and 18. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen... A smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. Now what's interesting here? People in the ancient world would know instantly what was going on here. We get just for, I didn't, I didn't write the scripture down to be put up. I'll just let you know about it. Jeremiah chapter 34 verse 18 says, uh, Those who have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two and then walked between the pieces. In other words, when you make a covenant, you cut, kill an animal, put them in half, you walk between the dead parts of the animal, and that's your pledge, I will, as I promise, keep my covenant to you. And if I don't, may I be treated like these animals. I can be killed. And instead of having Abraham walk there, God symbolically walks between them saying, I'm so serious about this, Abraham. If I don't keep it, they kill me. And so Abraham took this, that God was serious and making a covenant with him. And so from this point on, Abraham would be what I would call a stage two conformity person, where he believes God, now he's trying to work out how to live in a covenant with this God who has called him, to whom he finally believes, even though it's hard to believe because I'm older, Sarah's older, no children, lands occupied by other people, but I'm trusting in the promises of God in spite of all the reality of the circumstances that surround us. You see, Abraham is our spiritual father. 
The Jews, yes, physical, but our spiritual. Notice what Paul said in Romans 4, verse 16 and 17. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only those who are of the law, but also those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. So this is not just any a petty God that ancient people worship. This was the creator God that can raise the dead and can make something out of nothing. This is the God whom Abraham chose to believe and to serve. And we are called with fuller, better revelation and understanding to serve the same God. We, too, have to choose to live, you know, a life of conformity to God's will rather than doing our own thing. You have to leave doing your own thing behind and conform to the will of God. If you've been religious according to your own way of being religious, you can't do that. You've got to do things God's way if you want to be in a covenant relationship with him. So we've observed growth in Abram. He grew up an idolater, but now he's a man of faith. But he's at that conformity stage of faith. And so next week, we'll look at Abram as he goes through the questioning phase to finally conviction phase of faith as Abraham continues to grow. Just like Abraham was on a physical journey, he's on a spiritual journey. You and I are on a spiritual journey. We're intended to keep walking, to keep growing. And there's always room for more of that. So let Abraham be an encouragement to us. If he could come out of the background he came out of and trust the Lord, surely you and I, with a fuller revelation of God in Jesus Christ, can trust God and trust in his promises. Let us pray. Gracious God and loving Father, thank you for each one gathered here today. We pray, Father, that you help each one of us to be determined to be a people of faith, hope, and love. Help us, Father, to grow in our faith uh, so that we grow in our convictions, so that we can live out lives that glorify and honor you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.